That word is not by chance. Worship was not by chance. Everything divinely arranged by God. We really need to understand that. You need to grab hold of this moment. Don't let it pass you by. Take a minute to process what's been said to you. God has ordained us and he's predestined this this plan and we're walking this path. Understand what is happening. What he's preparing you for. I met with my my father uh, this week, and you know we sat down and we've been talking about this and and, and where the church is headed and and walking into a, a, a discipleship program and divinely ordained by God. So I told him today, I said, you know, I want to take the middle slot and do a ministry highlight. We call the middle slot here in the middle of the church the ministry highlight. You know, every once in a while we have somebody come up to talk about children's church or talk about youth. They'll talk about these different things. Well, here, I'm here to share my heart with you again for the second week in a row about what he's called us to do and where he's predestined us to be. Amen. Discipleship and mentoring changed my life. It will change yours. It will change yours. I would not be standing here. I would not. Had not somebody invested time in me. Had not I invested time in the word. It's twofold. Jesus says this. I I know that you are mine. My disciple. When you abide in We talked about this a little bit last week, and I'm just going to do a little reiteration here. I'm going to do a little follow-up. I'm going to do a little review. But discipleship is two-part. The written word and the word made flesh. It's Jesus and the written logos word. It's two parts. There's a couple steps, though. Think about this for a minute. There's a couple steps. Before you can teach someone to do what you do, before you can teach someone to be what you are, you first have to find someone who's willing to what? Follow. Are you willing to follow? That's the question. What's your true desire? Do I want to live, love, and look like Jesus? Or does I want to sit here in church and, and pray about a plan that, you know, you know Lord, I, I, I want to move this way. So often we get caught in a rut. What's the will for my life? Well, you got to follow first. Amen. Matthew 4, 18 through 20 says this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he, Jesus, said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Kind of silly, isn't it? Fishers of men. Kind of an odd analogy. Right? But the great teacher Jesus, what was he doing? He was making an analogy that fishermen could relate to. And to them, being a fisherman was the greatest call upon their life. Making disciples. And regardless of our profession, regardless of what we do, Touching people's lives 
with the love of Christ is the most important call that we have. It's more than just being behind this pulpit. Amen. God needs his disciples. God needs his people everywhere. And the church has been so misguided. We walk out onto the field. We walk out onto the battlefield, ill-equipped and ill-trained. So what do we do? We cause damage to the people we were sent to love. That's what happens. We must be trained. We must be discipled. We're called to build and to plant, not to destroy. I'm going to say it again. We are called to build. We are called to plant. We are called to grow. Amen. So guess what? God needs his people exactly where you are. In the schools. In the factories. In businesses. In the world. disciples Peter what did he do immediately he left his nets and followed him immediately he reclassified he reclassified what was important in his life right set all different types of priority Immediately. Think about that for a minute. He left his boats. He left his livelihood. He left everything behind. With this invitation to follow. Here's the thing. If we're not going to be misguided, if we're not going to walk into people's lives and mess them up. We have to have this thing called a foundation. Do we understand that? Mm. See, God has this, this, this way that he wants to build his king, kingdom, the way it's supposed to function. God's functionality is... Disciples, it's a fundamental key, and we must build upon the foundation. I'm going to read you a couple more scriptures here. Matthew 8, 24, or Matthew 7, 24 through 29. Whoever therefore hears my words and does them, hears my words and does them, I liken him as a prudent man, a man who built his house upon the rock. A prudent man, a wise man, a smart man. That Jesus says, hey, this is your sure foundation. Why do we need a sure foundation? So we don't suffer from self-deception. So we can train and equip others. Mercy mentoring, my friends, is a sure foundation. Amen. 25. And the rain came and the streams came and the wind blew and fell upon that house. And it did not fall for it had been founded Upon the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. I said, who's the rock? Jesus. Amen. His word, his example. Here's the thing. We're going we're gonna to contrast two foundations here. They all see the storm. 
I don't care who you are, Christian or not, you will see the storm. You will see the flood. You will see the rain. He never said he's going to keep you from these things. He's going to keep you through these things. Everyone has problems. Get over it. It's how you deal with it. 26. And everyone who hears my words and does not do them, they're like a foolish man, a stupid man, who built his house upon the sand. Here's the thing. It's easy to build a foundation in sand, is it not? It's easy. I mean, that's why we play at the beach with the kids in the sand. It's easy. We don't ask our kids to come build boulders, do we? <laughs> Lay bricks. Here, this is going to be fun. No, it's easy. Sand is easy. Building your foundation upon a rock takes effort. Takes thought. Thought about your present. Present. Thought about your future. Takes effort thought 27 the rain came down the streams came and the wind blew and beat upon the house and it fell and its fall was great we need to understand something when you build upon sand what is sand it's shifting it's moving right but what does it represent instability how about this every little granulate represents a way to pull or push you away from where you need to be. It's your own self-centered personal desires. Every little granulate, thousands of them under your feet, shifting. Think about it for a minute. I mean, how many here have teenage daughters? I, 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 I grew one. Sweet Jesus, help us. <laughs> right? And my teenage daughter thought that, you know what, I am going to build my life around this boy because, Daddy, I love him so much. Little Joey, I just love him. But then three weeks later, it's little Johnny. But he completes me, Daddy. No! That's shifting desire. That's not a firm foundation. Amen? And it come to pass when Jesus had finished these words, the crowd, they were astonished at his doctrine. The gospel message should have the same effect. Every time the gospel message is spoken, there should be astonishment there should be holy spirit filled revelation amen and if not you're not you don't have a sure foundation in jesus when we open our mouths we open our mouths and holy spirit filled truth and life and those who hear are astonished that is the gospel. And he taught them with all authority. Here's this word. I've been on authority now for a month. I didn't know it. Trust me. Lord, just give me something to speak. And it's all about authority. Amen. Hallelujah. And he taught them as having authority and not as the scribes. See, we need to understand something. Authority is not volume. I can sit up. I get excited. I can sit up here and scream or stand up here and scream, but that's not authority. That's right. That's right. God works in whispers. Yes. The gospel can be in a heavenly hush, and I can receive revelation and walk in power and authority. Amen. Let's not be confused. So do you want to know who you are in Christ? Join me next week. Hmm. 
Do you want to walk in power and authority? Join me next week. Do you want to understand the purpose and the plan for your life? I'm not going to be able to give it to you, but there's this guy named the Holy Spirit. And when you seek, you will find him. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad Daryl Lee came back into the room. She's handing out candy. I love it. So here's what I'm going to tell you. There's a lot of effort put into these classes. It's a lot of time. So we need to see who's vested and who's not. So Miss Daryl Lee, when you leave church tonight, if you're going to be here next week, we need a head count. You need to understand how many people are coming. we got to put books for. We're working on curriculum, the whole nine yards. But I want commitment. Amen. I want commitment. Amen. It's called come follow me. <laughs> Amen. You can also do this on your app too. Go to groups. Go to mentoring groups. See Mercy Mentoring. Click join. That easy. That is simple, easy. Amen? Amen. Let's have a moment of prayer. Father God, I come before you today, Lord, and I'm thanking you for this church, Lord. Lord, I stand here in awe and your depth and your breath and the scope of your love for us, Lord, as you lead us and guide us, your purpose and your plan. Lord, I'm asking you to give revelation, Lord. Reveal to them under the power of the Holy Spirit as to the need, the commission, the command that you've given us. Let it rise within them. Let them them grab hold. Let it bring faith, a faith that brings a foundation, Lord. We ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Without any further ado, your speaker for today. Amen. Give Pastor Jerry a round of applause. So good to be in the house of God. Amen. And everything just seemed to be lining up. Kayla, her call, the word of God coming through. And I like to share what God's put upon my heart. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God, and such we are. I was watching TV the other day, and there was this... Uh, all the new senators and congressmen are coming into the to the um, Capitol building, and this guy, this crazy guy, gave this prayer. Um, he said, uh, "God," and I pray in, in um, polytheistic, the multi-God. I'm praying to, and he tried to name a few off, and and I'm saying, "What? What?" I thought maybe this was a joke or something, and then at the end he says. A man and a woman, you know. And I says, wow, what's going on? And God just started dealing with me. And uh, you're looking at this verse, it says, behold. And this guy, according to his prayer, behold, Buddha. Behold, Muhammad. Behold that crazy lady with all them arms. Behold. Do you see anything? I don't. But you know what these born again believers can do? You know what we can do? We can point to the cross and say, Behold, what manner of love has the Father bestowed upon us? God would not call us to behold if He wasn't showing us and showed us. His love towards us. Behold, I want to concentrate on that that word just a little bit longer. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's down at the River Jordan baptizing people. All kinds of people come out to see to see this, what's going on. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were there, and, and 
John the Baptist turned to them. What are you, what are you here for? What trivial thing? Because are you here to watch the, the wind blow the leaves by the water? What's your purpose of being here? And then Jesus comes down and he gets baptized. And there was a gentleman by the name of Andrew watching. Now, unlike the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Andrew, who has become a disciple, beheld Jesus for what he was. He not only seen him with his eyes, he seen him with the spirit in his heart. Amen. In Numbers 21, chapter 21, and it's just a, it's a description, this few verses, a description of the Bible. I tell you, uh, they complained and they were in sin, okay, like always, the people traveling around with, with Moses out in the desert. And they got done with their rebellion. Rebellion, sin is nothing but rebellion, what God says, Amen. Anything other than what God says is sin. Amen? So fiery serpents came into the camp and was biting them. And they were dropping like flies. And the people cried out to Moses. And Moses cried out to God. And, and God says, hey, Moses, take, a, take this serpent, this fiery serpent, put it on a, on a banner and lift it up. And all those that behold the serpent that was bitten shall instantaneously be saved and not die. Wow. And do you know the ones that looked? And it's a symbol of Jesus Christ being that serpent, being raised up on that cross. You can see it in the medical field. They had that same symbol. They looked at that and they were instantaneously healed. But you know some of them? Wouldn't, Pat, some of them wouldn't even raise their head. They just died in that state. They refused to behold as God commanded them to do. Amen? Revelations, Jesus is talking. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Behold, I stand at the door. I'm pounding at the door. Behold me. Come open the door and find out what I'm all about. Open the door and let me come into your home, to your life. Let me show you things. So what God is trying to do and telling us, he wants to show his love towards us. On Calvary Hill, where Jesus Christ was crucified for each and every one of us. That's something we can see. I can see, I can behold the love of God every time I look to Calvary. Can you? Can you see the love and the compassion and the concern Jesus had for us to go ahead and lay down his life, the Father to send him? No greater love. He loved us. And on Calvary Hill, there was people that just came out, the Pharisees and Sadducees, to see what was going on. You had Roman soldiers putting him to death. You had people that loved him and followed him there. And as he hung up there on the cross, people beheld him. But some of the Word of God says in Matthew 13, 13, I, eyes, I've given you eyes to see, but you see not. Ears that you hear, but you understand and believe not. But the one that you think is the craziest thing, conversion, that there was, there was a soldier, was a command to put him to death, the centurion soldier. And at the end, at that crucifixion, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. He had the ability, hallelujah, to behold our God. Praise God, Hallelujah. I am so excited. God, help me get through this. My heart is, is just so bubbling and full and running over. So God is getting our attention, you know. God is telling us to behold. And then we look at that, that word up. 
What does that word mean? And God's instruction is to fix our eyes upon, to observe with care, to give your undivided attention, to look upon with not only your eyes, your heart, your mind, your very soul. It's, a, it's an expressing a command when God tells us to behold. And so if we're beholding, we're the beholder. We're a spectator looking. We're a spectator observing. And as you look upon the cross, as you look upon Jesus, as you look upon this love manifested, Jesus is a manifestation of God's love. He was the only begotten Son of God that willingly came down because He loved us and sacrificed Himself for us. And so as we are beholding, what happens? We're taking it in. We're fixated. We become confused with this. And it transforms us, amen? Doesn't the cross, and when we understand all that he done on the cross for us, and we ask him to come into our hearts and life, we accept that, we beheld it, and that's God's manifestation of his love towards us. That yet when we were in our sins, we didn't love God. We were doing our own thing and we were in rebellion. But it, well, it, he loved us when in our worst condition. And he said his son to be the appropriation for our sin. That he, not that we didn't sin, we sinned, but Jesus Christ paid the price for us. Amen? What a kind, loving God we have. Not only calls us his children, the Bible says we are. We are his children. And he treats us like his children. Amen. He don't hold back anything from us. Beloved, now that we're the sons of God, it doesn't appear yet what, we're, what we're, we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And the Bible says that we see through darkly, one day we'll see him face to face. Amen? One day we'll see him face to face. There's more to this verse, but I, don't, I get happy. I get really happy when I think about going to heaven. And I think about, you know, this body is earthly body 101. And I can't wait to trade it into that heavenly body. Amen? <laughs> Glory to God. Pat, when we get to heaven, no more funeral dinners. He'll tell you, hey, sister, you come into your rest. Amen. I could just see us coming into the glory now, don't you? I could just, Mike, you'll probably look at the streets of gold and say, I'm a paver. Lord, I got this covered. He said, no, brother, just come on in. It's all taken care of. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Sister Rose, you're going to have all your lessons planned out. I, Lord, I got seven lessons on worship. You say, just go on in there, sister, and just start worshiping him. Praise God. Praise God. Our God is good. Amen. That band, has, <laughs> the Brecca family, they'll be up there with the angels wanting to play the guitar and the organs and celebrating. Kendra, where's Wendy at? Oh, my goodness. She'll be flying around praising God. You won't even know where that woman is at. Where is she? You know, Caleb will be praising and worshiping God. Amen. All you pantry people, you'll be worrying about that marriage supper of the Lamb, and they'll say, no, your work is done. Come into my rest. Hallelujah. No more oil, oil to anoint people for their sick because we'll have no sickness. We'll have no death. 
At the marriage supper of the Lamb, where's Coffee Joe at? Man, he'll be walking down there with this pot where everybody got to sleep. <laughs> we got it covered, Joe. You go ahead and relax. That's what I'm excited about. That's what I look forward to. And I see Victor back in there in, the, in that room. So glad he's here. Amen. I was at the camp one time, and Chris was there playing his guitar and worshiping God. And around the corner, Victor was cutting the rug. I mean, he was dancing. He was, ooh, he was having a good old time. And I just imagine right then and there, King David and Victor just dancing before that throne, just having themselves a good time in Jesus. Hallelujah. And Doc, Char, you won't mind trading in your bike for a fiery chariot to ride around a couple times, will you? Char, will you ride with him? Oh, man. That's going to be one beautiful time in Jesus, ain't it? Praise God. But that verse is more than that. Because the Bible says that we have sonship now. And we are joint heirs with Jesus now. And the Bible is telling you, as you behold him, there's that transmit. As you understand, as you become a disciple in Jesus Christ and learn what love Christ has for us. Amen. I want uh, this. This blew me away, and it was the hardest thing in the Word of God for me to understand. And it's in chapter John 17, where he talks about, he gave the demonstration of how much he loves us. And I'm just going to pick some verses out of there, go home and read it. But the kind of love God has for each and every one of us Jesus is praying. He's about to be sacrificed. He's about to go to slaughter, Penny. He's about to do all, go through, and descend in how he's about to do it all. And this is the last thing that's on his heart. And he's praying this to the God the Father. He's crying out for us to keep us safe in this world. So I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying not to take him out of us, the world, but to keep us while we're here. And the sure foundation and the best thing he gave to us, hallelujah, is that spirit of God on the day of Pentecost come in our hearts and our lives. The kingdom of God is here, amen. He is our comforter, amen. He sees us through everything. And it's got enough that we can share with others too, amen. But one thing that he said in, on these verses, Father, Jesus is saying, Father, you are in me. And I... I'm in you. And I pray that they also may be in us. You love us them even as you loved me. They will behold my glory. The end of the chapter. That the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I came to the crazy conclusion, God, my Father, loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. Is that what that verses are telling you? Is that, there's not, he's a God with, with infinite love. He's a God that loves us through the thick and the thin. He's a God that loves us through every problem, every situation, every hang-up, every sin, everything that we have in our hearts and our lives. He will be our deliverer. If we're not walking as close as we want with Jesus, and we have shortcomings, hallelujah, I'm the first one to raise my hand. I need to behold him more. I need to look at that love more. I need to be drawn to that, I need to be drawn to that love like a, like a fire burning in my bones. Hallelujah. I praise God. That's what he's looking for. That's what happens. And in the verse, and everyone that has this hope, the hope of seeing Jesus, the hope of becoming more like Christ, in him purifies himself. Everyone that has this hope in him 
that hope in Jesus purifies himself. Purification was becoming more Christ-like, even as he is pure, to obtain to that. Are we perfect? No way. Is it saying that we're perfect? No way. But you know what it is saying? It's telling us that we need more than ever when we come to the cross his spirit of kingdom of God has come into us so what happened when it happened to you I have three words down here passion, compassion faction and refaction three is both of them together the passion it's called the first love do you remember that first love? You come up to that altar, you wanted to hug everybody. You, had, you were called out of darkness into the light. You were called from death to life. The joy of the Lord filled you up and carried you over. You were, hallelujah, that brand new spanking baby, hallelujah. And the blood of Jesus has just brought you into whole life. Praise God, and that's a passion, the passion God has placed in your heart. A passion, build a read the word of God. Maryland to pray without ceasing. To have the word of God right before you. All the everything else seemed to didn't matter anymore. Amen. You found your Jesus, you found life. You found it all in him. Amen. So as far as discipleship goes, he's been talking about that passion, that first love, getting back to that very basic things of putting God first in your life. We walk through this world and we get too much garbage. We need to let that thing flow. I, he I heard Wendy up there just letting it flow over you. Let the flow over you. Let, let all that garbage, let all that stuff that clings to us go. We can be in the presence of God, and he can only see the sun blood applied. He can see his child down there praising and worshiping him. We need to put Jesus first. We need to have him supreme in our lives. And that compassion... Compassion, recognizing the suffering of others. Then taking action is not just a word of, uh, of just talking. Taking action to help them. And it embodies a tangible expression of the love of God for those that are suffering. Everywhere Jesus went. Compassion on a multitude, compassion on that blind person, compassion on that lady, the issue of blood. She had passion. What did she do? She pressed through the crowd. Do you have that kind of passion for Jesus? You're going to climb up a sycamore tree and find out what's going on? Are you going to be Paul and willingly lay your head down on the chopping block? The compassion that's inside that Holy Spirit that wants to communicate with the Father and see us, the, the life, the purpose life. Amen? And that fashion and refashion, you're, you're the potter's clay. You're that piece of clay. He's going to fashion. He's going to put you on that wheel, and he's going to mold you, and he's going to make you. It to the happiest life ever. Amen? The world ain't really that good to you. <laughs> Amen? You know, when you're young, you think, oh, man, it don't take long for the Satan to do a number on your lives. Amen? Don't take long for him to drag you down, use you up, and kick you to the side. Amen. So he's fashioning and refashioning us to what he wants us to make it. And discipleship, as Stephen keeps calling out, is a way of doing that. 
a way of learning and getting into the Word, learning what the Father is like. And when you, when you behold him, he sent Christ to, to be beheld by us. He is the Son of God, the first fruits. Amen. We have a sonship, we have kinship with him. Amen. Jesus is our big brother. Amen. You know, I, I have, uh, I'm going to have a birthday party for an Amish kid today. I, I know him when he was just second grade or whatever. His father raised him up. There's three boys in a row. They had a bunch of girls in the middle, and they got three little ones at the end. And this Amish kid, he's just like 18, and he's just turning 19. But he takes his little brothers, and I sat there and watched him. He, you pound the nail this way, not that way. Daddy wants it done. The horse is done this way. Father wants it done that way. You need to clean up this the way Dad wants it done. Jesus Christ came to earth every step of the way to show us how to be reunited with the Father. It was through his blood. But how do we live? We live by the example Jesus gave to us here on earth. Did you see compassion flowing out of him? Did you see the love flowing out of him? Do you see him doing his own will? No. Father, I, I was up on that Mount of Olives. There's a holiness there. Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Norma, he felt every nail. He felt every whip. He bled, praise God, but he was obedient unto the Father. Every word that comes out of the mouth of God, out in that word of Bible, we are to live by and not rebel against it. You do not, no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how clever you think you are, no matter how you think you can rewrite the Bible, God's way is the best way. Amen. And anything else is, re is, is rebellion against him. Praise God. So, in conclusion, we want to have let God work with us and refashion us. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ. No longer we're going to make decisions on our own. Amen? No longer we are going to take everything and filter it through the Word of God. We're going to pray about it. And we're going to ask that, that guidance, that comforter, that Holy Spirit inside of us leads us in all ways. Amen? We are being obedient. We are going to crucify on the cross our fleshly desires. You got that? Can you say that? We're going to crucify on the cross our self-will. Amen? And what is left is the will of God. And he says, what is left? If you do, you pick up your cross and you follow me. I will answer all your prayers and I will give you that life. And the last one on there is that purpose. God purposed each and every one of us. And you cannot behold him. You cannot behold the love of God and miss it. Amen? But you can behold it and open up to your life. A life of meaning, a life of purpose. If you're bored and if you're tired and you're weary, you're not looking to the cross and seeing what God has for you. If you're stumbling in the dark, you're not looking to the light. Amen? Believe me, I've been in all those positions and places. But when I focus my eyes on the cross, on his love, behold what matter of love God has always seen me through. God has always had those answers for me. Thank you very much, and God bless you.